Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Gabriel Meyer, the executive director of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Um, tonight is something of an experiment for us, a um, guided study session rather than um, a lecture per se, uh, an introduction to Ruskin's uh, landmark group of essays on what he called the first principles of political economy unto this last. Essays considered so radical and unsettling in their day that the publisher Thackeray stopped the presses after the first four of what had been a commissioned seven essays were issued in Cornhill Magazine in 1860. I'll be admitting people during the course of these remarks. Over the next uh, three weeks, Professor Jim Spates will take us interactively through each of the four uh, essays of Unto This Last, reading selected excerpts from each of them in turn with open discussion, not only at the end, which would be the normal way we do things here, but after each excerpt. So there will be something of a, of a, of a real interaction about this material as we make our way through it. The committee that plans our programs is thinking of making this study dimension that we're exploring tonight something that we do uh, that we do regularly, uh, at least once a year. That is uh, a study a major work of Ruskin uh, together in this fashion. A couple of preliminary important remarks before we begin. Um, in order for these study sessions to be really effective. Those of us attending should read the whole essay or essays we're studying first. Obviously, a paragraph here or a paragraph there only gives us highlights, not the whole flow of Ruskin's argument, which is such an important thing, and particularly with uh, this work, Unto This Last. In the past sessions, for example, that we've done on Unto This Last, We've always found that concerns raised in discussion about one excerpted paragraph are often actually addressed in the next. So as, as in everything in life, context uh, is everything. Um, there are links to a PDF of the whole book of the, of the complete unto this last are available on the Ruskin website, in the calendar section underneath the text about this, about these sessions. Um, with uh, Clive Wilmer's uh, comprehensive notes and commentary, uh, and in addition to Clive's notes, uh, wonderful, uh, exhaustive notes on, on Ruskin, all the references, um, his uh, excellent introduction is worth the price of admission. Each of the book's four essays will also be available as a PDF. So as we move through these four essays, each of them will be on our website so you can look at them uh, separately. Um, and as an aid to these discussions, uh, Jim's selections of paragraphs for each of the sessions are also available there. So each time we'll uh, uh, give you a link to the particular paragraphs we're gonna be looking at. Um, a little preliminary reading, I think, will go a long way towards making these sessions and our discussions more fruitful. Uh, because of the interactive factor, we're doing something differently tonight with regard to muting. Normally, we mute everyone at the beginning uh, when the speaker is, uh, begins to speak, and then we only unmute at the discussion at the end. Um, I'm going to ask actually each of you if you will. Uh, uh, make sure that you mute yourselves when Jim starts speaking and then unmute when you wish to speak uh, during the various times for discussion. Rather than going back and forth and having me uh, control that process, I think if you'll just mute yourself when Jim is speaking and unmute when you wish to say something during the discussions, uh, I think that'll make these exchanges a little freer, a little less awkward. Jim Spates is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in Geneva, New York. He is the co-founder with Sarah Atwood uh, in 2020 of the Ruskin Society of North America. 
and webmaster of the blog site whyruskin.wordpress.com. Uh, He's a companion of Ruskin's Guild of St. George, a member of the Roycroft campus community, and uh, last but not least, a member of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. For the last three decades, Jim has re lectured re regularly in both the US, US and UK on various aspects of Ruskin's life and work. He is the author of many published articles on Ruskin and of the book, The Imperfect Round, Helen Gill Fuljun's Life of Ruskin. Currently, um, sorry, I have lost a page here. Currently he is writing Availing Toward Life, The Radical Social Thought of John Ruskin, a striking title, I think, a book dedicated to making Ruskin's masterpiece of social and economic criticism unto this last accessible to a new generation of readers. And so without further ado, Jim Spates. Thank you, Gabriel. I, I hope everyone can hear me. It's, it's a delight to see everyone um, and to get going on this session. I think that the Ruskin Art Club idea of doing a work of Ruskin seriously working with the text every November is a wonderful idea. Um, and Unto This Last is a wonderful place to start. Unto This Last is probably the pivotal work in Ruskin's life. Um, he, uh, it, it appeared in 1860 in a, four, in a series of four essays in a, in a magazine called The Cornhill, published in London by Smith and Elder, which were Ruskin's regular publishers of his books. Um, and I wanna tell you just a little bit about it. G Gabe, can we show this a couple of slides here to start us off? I'm not, of this course. is gonna be a slideshow, but we're gonna have just a couple of images to begin. This is, um, this is uh, Ruskin's self-portrait uh, watercolor that is at the National Gallery in, in London and uh, from 1861. And it's one of my favorite portraits of Ruskin. Um, it gives you a sense, uh, unto this last, the essays appeared, as I said, in 1860. So um, this was pretty contemporary with those essays. And uh, Gabriel, let's look at the second image, if you would. Oh, this is Margaret Ruskin. This is Ruskin's mother. Uh, done by James Northcott. This painting is at Brantwood Ruskin's home in the Lake District um, in England. And uh, there, there's his father, Gabe. Let's go back to the mother for a moment. Uh, a very pivotal aspect of this story of, of Unto This Last is, is Ruskin's mother's influence on his life. She was a very, 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 I could go on for another 15 minutes with the word very strict evangelical Christian. And she brought her son up in the Bible at the time she believed that, um, as did I think all evangelicals um, of, of her stripe, they all believed that every word in the Bible was a direct revelation from God. And Ruskin, from the time he was tiny, uh, Margaret dedicated her son, the only son she would ever have, in fact, the only child she ever had, she dedicated him to the glory of God. Uh, from his first day, and as soon as she was able, she began reading to him from the Bible. As soon as he was able, a couple of years later, maybe a little bit less in his case because he was so smart, um, she began having him read back to her um, from the Bible itself. They would start the very first verse of Genesis, work their way to the very last verse of Revelation, and then start all over again and go all the way through. The result of this is that Ruskin became one of the great biblical scholars of his age, indeed perhaps of any age uh, in, in, in Western society. And his works are just chock full. If you've read much Ruskin, of course you see that there are biblical references all the time through, throughout all his writings, sometimes four or five in the same sentence. Um, he read the Bible every day of his life. He used the King James Version, although he knew all the other versions that were available at the time. Um, he read the King James Version, and I'm going to cite you a passage from it just a moment. Gabe, let's look at the picture of his father. There's John James Ruskin. That's Ruskin's father. Um, he was a very successful sherry merchant in London. He became uh, what we would call rich, although not rich by the standards of many of the people who live around the LA area. But he certainly was very wealthy. He was so wealthy 
that they could travel where they wanted when they wanted. And he, his son really had private tutors all his life to bring him up and the very best private tutors he got. Uh, his son Ruskin went to uh, Oxford as a gentleman commoner in the, uh, in the, in the 1820s and, um, and graduated with, his, with distinction from Oxford, uh, gaining a major poetry prize before he graduated. And then his first book, Modern Painters, the first book that caught the public's uh, attention appeared in 1843 when he was 24. Ruskin was born in 1819. Let me go, let me go back and tell you, I wanna get you to onto this last very quickly. I don't want this to be a long lecture. I want this to be an introduction to the paragraphs we're gonna to share together tonight. So Ruskin first became of notice to the English public and to the English speaking public in 18, uh, 1843 with the publication of Modern Painters, the first volume of Modern Painters. He did not know that it was going to be the first volume of Modern Painters. It was just called Modern Painters. And the burden of the book was to prove that J.M.W. Turner was the greatest painter since the great masters of the Renaissance. Uh, and he uh, spent um, he spent months, if not years, getting ready to write this book. And the prose in it was so mesmerizing. People were just taken by Ruskin's paragraphs and his thoughts. And uh, he became very famous very quickly, even at this young age, and uh, became so famous that he went on to write other books because of largely public demand and his own desire to write more. The second volume, uh, a second volume of Modern Painters, volume Modern Painters Two, came out in 1847, um, and it was essentially a revivification of the greatness of the great masters of the of the Middle and Late Renaissance, Tintoretto, and so on, um, and again caught the public imagination. He followed this in 1849 with a, with this masterpiece on architecture called The Seven Lamps of Architecture, which, which I still believe after having read it now a number of times, is the greatest book on architecture that was ever uh, ever written, still is, um, and uh, is available. Some of the manuscript is available at the Huntington Museum, very near all of you LA folk um, where, where you live. Um, and you can, if you're a scholar, you can go and read it. I've done so with Gabriel and it was a wonderful experience, done it two or three times. In any event, the, the uh, Seven Lamps of Architecture was as a revelatory of architecture. He took on all the architecture critics of the age and said that in effect, you've kind of got it all wrong. If architecture is gonna be great, it has to be elevating, has to help human beings feel better about themselves and their lives. Um, and then uh, in the 1850, and then shortly after that, he published 1851 to 53, he published a huge three volume work called Stones of Venice where he had gone to Venice for uh, about at least a year's study. And he studied in Venice and, uh, um, and studied all the buildings and all the artwork and, and, and then took his readers through uh, all the great artwork of, uh, of Venice and the stones itself. He said the story of the whole civilization can be told in the stones of Venice. We tell the truth in our architecture because we tell in our architecture what we really believe and what we think are the most important things. And then in the latter part of the 1850s, um, he published the four, third and fourth volumes of Modern Painter. These are all massive books, 500, 600 page books. Um, wonderful to read still, all of them wonderful to read, but you have to be patient reading them. And uh, by the middle part of the 1850s, he was beginning to be very discouraged. And the discouragement came from the fact that all his books were essentially fundamentally moral arguments. He was railing against the industrial age that he was part of. He thought that, that people were out there essentially just destroying the environment as they were and um, calling them to task on that, asking them to change their ways. They weren't too anxious about changing their ways. They all wanted to be rich. Um, and, so, um, and so he began to get discouraged and thought, I can't keep doing this. So he gave up writing on art and architecture in the late 1850s and said, I have to take a new tack. And the new tack was to go after what he called the, the, the so-called the soi de sang, um, the soi de sang science, uh, so-called science, putative science of political economy, um, of, uh, which was popular at the time that had been essentially put forth by Adam Smith and Thomas Malthus and John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham. And he thought all of these people were fundamentally off, off base. And we'll get to that in just a moment. 
So that let, led him to want to write something that would show his views on the matter. That led to the four essays that became unto this last. Because he was so famous, he said to his publisher, I would like to publish some articles on political economy. They said, yes, we'll do it. We will put the articles in our new magazine called the Cornhill Magazine. And they started appearing in the, feather in, in the fairly late months of 1860 and immediately erased in a, an enormous furor because they, they, they took on the, 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 the age itself and they took on the whole notion that the idea that riches, riches were the object of doing business, et cetera. Um, Unto this last, many of people, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to read you now. This is coming to the Bible reading part of the evening. Unto this last is based, uh, it's fundamentally based throughout on a single story from the New Testament, Christ's parable of the vineyard owner and his laborers um, from the gospel according to Matthew. As I said, Ruskin was this great biblical scholar. And one of the things that he would argue throughout his works is that you all say that you're good and performing and believing Christians, but the truth is you're going out and with impunity crushing um, all, all your fellow human beings as quickly as, as you can do so, so that you can become richer yourselves. And he, want, he argued very strenuously against this. So under this last is based on the following parable from the Gospel according to St. Matthew's chapter 20, if you want to look it up. I'm, I'm going to read it to you. It comes from it comes from the King James Version, which was the version that Ruskin used all his life, as I mentioned earlier. So here's the story. This is Christ speaking. His, uh, as he went around the countryside preaching, people said, Jesus, tell us, tell us more about where you came from. He said, well, I come from a place I call the kingdom of heaven. And they say, well, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And he said, well, I can't really tell you quite what it's like because you haven't been there. I can kind of, I can give you an analogy about what it might be like. And the parable is intended to give them, a, to give his hearers a sense of what, of what the um, uh, kingdom of heaven is like. And it begins and goes as follows. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder who went, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out, out, out again about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, go ye also into my vineyard and what, whatever's right, I will give you. And they too went their way. And then he went out again about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others still standing idle in the market. And he said unto them, why are you standing here all the day idle? And they said back to him, because no man has hired us. So the vineyard owner said, well, I will hire ye then go also into the vineyard and whatever is right that ye shall receive. So when the evening tide was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to the, his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto, unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the 11th hour, they each, every man received a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise, every man received a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house saying, these last have wrought but one hour and thou hast made them equal to us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But the vineyard owner answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that which, which thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? And so the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called and few chosen. And this is the parable that runs through all the entire text of unto this last that was so important for Ruskin that the phrase unto this last, we will come back to it later on as, as we make our way through. So, in that parable, we have a couple of points that are really uh, very fundamentally important. The notion of being just to everybody who works for you. Remember, Ruskin's job is to take on the political economists of his day. The, the object of business, and then we will get to this before our hour is up tonight. The object of business is not to make money, but to, but to do something that is good for the nation and treat the people who work for you well along the way. Um, and the, the essence of part of that story is 
the necess necessity of productive work for everyone. And a penny of a day, I probably should add at this point, a penny a day at the time that um, uh, at the time that the parable was was admitted was certainly adequate to meet all the expenses that any normal laborer would have during that day. That would mean food and clothing and shelter and enough left over to take care of those who depended on him or her. Uh, and the second is so fair pay for all. He paid them all the same. The ones that started at the beginning, the ones that started at the end so that they would all have their penny a day. And the second point is to take on this whole issue of what is the best way to do business itself. So that, Gabriel, is sort of an introduction to why Ruskin got to Unto This Last and the four essays of Unto This Last. Um, and so I thought maybe what we would do is we will begin with the first paragraph that is part of the reading for today. And what we're trying to do um, as we go through these paragraphs is to, I, it was very hard to excerpt just the bits that were the most important in these essays, because actually all the things that Ruskin says in these four essays are incredibly important. Um, so here's the first, here's the first paragraph um, that we were going to go through and talk about tonight. Among the delusions, this is Ruskin, among the delusions which at different periods have possessed themselves of the minds of large masses of the human race, perhaps the most curious, certainly the least creditable is the modern soi de science of political economy based on the idea that an advantageous code of social action may be determined irrespectively of the influence of social affection which means the care for the people who work for you um, or the care for the products that you're making. And that's the story of unto this last of the parable that we read just a moment ago. I'm gonna read you just a little bit more, which was not part of the paragraph uh, that you see on your screen ahead of you. Ruskin writes in the following paragraph immediately after the one I just read, he said, so just lean back, close your eyes and listen to his words. Of course, as in the instances of alchemy, astronomy, rich witchcraft and other such popular creeds, political economy has a plausible idea at the root of it. The social affections say the economists are accidental and disturbing elements of human nature, but avarice and the desire of progress are constant elements. Let us eliminate the inconstants in considering the human being merely as a covetous machine examined in by what laws of labor, purchase and sale. The greatest cumulative result in wealth is obtainable. So Ruskin, uh, the thing is that unto this last, apart from all the other treatises of the time, was Ruskin's uh, was Ruskin's uh, argument against this notion of human uh, human nature being essentially aggressive. There's Darwin in the background of that paragraph I just read you, even though Darwin was not there, nor is Darwin mentioned in unto this last. Darwin's uh, Origin of Species was also was published in 1859 the year before unto this last. I don't know whether Ruskin had read it by that time, but Ruskin is taking on the, the assumption that we are just beasts like all the other beasts and our only job is to serve ourselves. Our only belief is that we should serve ourselves first. And um, so he, he, his becomes the first systematic attack on the cruelty visited on people by laissez-faire capitalism. Laissez-faire capitalism means essentially no holds barred. You, you do whatever you can to serve your own interests. Ruskin is attacking that notion at the very beginning. The beginning, the idea um, be determined irrespectively of the influence of social affection. The idea of social affection, um, the idea that you can treat other people just as, as, let's say, units, as integers, and you can take advantage of them as you would um, almost anything else objective, Ruskin is completely against that kind of thinking and thinking, no, no, human beings are in fact something very special. They're very different from, um, from other things in the world. And we, should, we have to recognize this. Um, so this is a, a first systematic attack in English on laissez-faire capitalism and it raised a furor as we mentioned a moment ago. The great mistake of the political economists Mill, Ricardo, Smith, Bentham, etc., was to think that human beings were just like covetous machines. So that's, a, that's the image that he uses. Um, and, and they were just out to take as much advantage to devour each other, as the poet called it, red in tooth and claw. No, says Ruskin, that's a distortion of reality. Um, people are different, different kinds of things. 
And we should take account of that. Until we take account of that, we can't have any real science of political economy. So that's, that's in essence how Ruskin got to onto this last. That's the first paragraph and a half of, of the text itself. I think what I'll do is I'll pause here for a moment, see if there's any questions from your side, and then we'll go on to the next paragraph. Gabriel? Yeah. I invite questions from the audience if there are any. Well, I think the point, Jim, that you made, which is, is so crucial for this, often I think if we look at the arguments in Unto This Last as simply economic arguments, we miss the point that for, for Ruskin, this he thinks the mistake, as he sees it, that Ricardo and Mill and, and that uh, Smith are making is a mistake not about economics, but about the human person. Absolutely right. But the nature Absolutely of the, right. the nature of the human person uh, itself, and of course, right. as as, you, as wisely as you pointed out, that dovetails with Dar with a re a certain reading of Darwin, that That's evolution right. also is the process of violence and competition, right? Uh, which again, Ruskin rejects not simply on the basis of um, sentiment, but on the basis of the way that he reads nature. Well, that's right. We are moral. We are moral. Nature. We are moral creatures. We we have choice in the matter, and I'll get to that in just a moment, yeah. um, as, as we go further. But he does not believe in this notion that human beings are simply beasts. We have a much deeper complexity to ourselves. We have a phrase that we often use. Uh, I think we still use it. We say to people that we're taking advantage of or harming in some way in in the market. We say, it's not personal. It's just business. Ruskin's argument would always be, all business is personal. You're either helping someone or you're hurting someone, but the idea, uh, you're, there's another human being involved in the transaction with you. All business is personal. You can't objectify it and make it into some sort of mathematical problem uh, that you're trying to solve in order to make uh, your, your own pockets a little bit larger. In fact, the absurdity of that, uh, it's just business, uh, uh, it was um, highlighted in the um, in the film The Godfather when someone is about to be murdered by a mafioso, and I says uh, he apologized to he apologized to him apologizes to him and says I'm sorry it's just business. Yeah. You know, what could be more personal than <laughs> yeah. being murdered? Okay, if there's any, nothing Any else other to... questions or comments? All right, let's move on to our second paragraph. Uh, it's a little bit later in the essay. Ruskin goes on and basically talks about how some, some writers of the time are trying to prove that um, the, the interests of the, uh, the interests of owner believed that he had responsibility for all the people who came to work for him and that he had to pay them enough to let a decent living wage so that tomorrow if he wanted to hire them again they would be ready and full to be fully ready to be hired and go go out to work again in full health so the second paragraph um is where he takes on goes further with this um this argument about um about human beings being different in how they they treat the world Obstinately, he, this is a little bit a uh, sentence just before what's up on your screen. Obstinately, the masters take one review of the matter, obstinately, the operatives another, and no political science can set them at one. It can't be settled. The, uh, some people say the, ma ma Marx would argue that the masters and the workers were always at odds with one another. Marx was around in these days. He was in London and he was working in the British Library. Ruskin, I, as far as I know, never met him. I don't believe that Ruskin ever read him. I don't know that. Um, but in any event, um, Ruskin, uh, Ruskin is saying here, we, can, we can't, this is not something that we can know. The human nature is not like that. He, Ruskin goes on to say in the paragraph that is on your screen, it would be strange if it could, it not being by science of any kind that men were ever intended to be set at one. Disputant after disputant, vainly strive to show that the interests of the masters are or are not antagonistic to those of the, of the men. None of the pleaders ever seeming to remember that it does not absolutely or always follow that the persons 
must be antagonistic because their interests are, if there's a, a crust, this is a wonderful example. If there's only a crust of bread in the house and mother and children are starving, their interests are, are not the same. If the mother eats it, the children want it. If the children eat it, the mother must go hungry to her work. Yet it does not necessarily follow, and this is a crucial part of the argument, that there will be antagonism between them, that they will fight for the crust and that the mother being strongest will get it and eat it. Neither in any other case, whether the relations of the persons may be, whatever the relations of the persons may be, can it be assumed for certain that because their interests are diverse, they must necessarily regard each other with hostility and use violence or cunning to obtain the advantage. In other words, it is not a question of human nature. Human beings are not the same as other kinds of creatures in the world, if indeed other creatures in the world are really like that. It is not human nature to be aggressive and violent and to be out for me first uh, at, at the expense of everybody else. Ruskin goes on, not on your screen. Ruskin goes on a little bit later. He says, even if this were so, uh, and it were just as it is convenient to consider man is actuated by no other moral influences as, than those which affect rats or swine, the logical conditions of the question are still indeterminable. So Ruskin believes in human agency. He believes that we are, we are conscious, conscious, sentient beings that we have choice in matters we can decide to move in one direction or another we have no way of knowing really what the mother will do she may eat she may eat the crust of bread she may break it up into smaller pieces and give some to the children she may give it all to the children we never know what she's going to do she herself may not know what she's going to do it's that's why it's such a wonderful example um she 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 can do something that is what we would then regard from the abstract as being selfish or but we don't know that she's going to do that human nature is not necessarily selfish or aggressive or violent uh and we try to then destroy the others as we come into contact with them in in their lives and in the last sentence that you see on the screen they must know they must necessarily regard each other with hostility and use violence or cunning to obtain their advantage. Um, okay, so Gabriel, let's pause again, see if we have any comments from the audience on this. I can respond for a moment and say that Ruskin is going directly against most of the political economists of his day and most of the business people of his day were in, were in business to make, they thought just to make money and they would do whatever they could to make more money. And if they could pay people less in order to make money, they would, they would pay people to make less to make money. Um, and Ruskin always thought, as the vineyard owner didn't think that, the vineyard owner might have been able to get away with half a penny a day. Um, but he did, decided not to do it because he knew that his workers needed a penny a day in order to live and survive and be decently ready, uh, strong enough to work the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, let me suggest that uh, important to our understanding of human freedom is our understanding that the goods which are open to us are manifestly not exhaustive goods. If there was some one good that appeared to me to entail all other goods, then I wouldn't really be free in my action. I would seek that good. However, uh, it, our human nature is such that if our heads are on straight, <laughs> we'll realize that no one good that is open to us is exhaustive. And because no one good is exhaustive, uh, there's a range of freedom open to us. And uh, just as it's critically important to have the right view of human nature, I also think it's critically important to have a right view of the good in relation to particular limited goods. And uh, we oftentimes don't have that right view of the good. And so we're inclined to think that this good is it, when in fact, uh, even if we acquire it, a couple of weeks later, we'll realize that it's not exhaustive. Uh, can I ask Jim? Uh... Uh, what about the disputes of, uh, about? I, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Uh, Anne? Uh, could you speak a little louder? I can't quite hear you. 
Oh, oh, all right. Uh, could you say something about the disputes about slavery that were going on at the time as, as background? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to change my speaker. Well, um, the issue well, the issue of Ruskin and, and slavery is a complex one, um, and not one we really want to get into. No, I, no, I meant as background. You talked about Darwin in the background. Well, before Darwin's Origin of Species appeared in 1859, there had been discoveries in geology uh, and biology in the decades before that uh, began to make it very clear that the biblical view of creation as having occurred in seven days um, could not possibly be correct according to the, the data of the world itself. And so, um, and so he is partly writing in, in, in against that particular notion about the human nature thing. He said, these, these, these folks who believe that we are just covetous machines are making an unwarranted and an unproven assumption about human nature. And your point uh, or the points being made that human beings have this choice about what they choose to do, how much they intend to devote their energy to it and so on is always the central issue of how they behave. We are a fundamentally unpredictable and we will always be unpredictable. That is Ruskin's argument. None of this can be settled. There's nothing automatic about this. There's nothing you can know for certain about which way anybody's gonna finally choose. I think, Jim, one of the things here that strikes me is maybe a little further in the paragraph that you were reading. Um, again, it's that idea that um, against the classical economists about the naturally built-in antagonism between uh, employers and employee, he says, um, but in the division of profits, the gain of the one may or may not be the loss of the other. It is not the master's interest to pay wages so low as to leave the men sickly and depressed, nor the workman's interest to be paid high wages if the smallness of the master's profit hinders him from enlarging his business or conducting it in a safe and liberal way. That's a true, stoker yeah. ought not to desire high pay if the company is too poor to keep the engine wheels in repair. So that yes. again, that, that notion of the common good um, rather, rather than simply um, individually motivated avarice. Yeah. I, I, I think you're right. That's an earlier passage that we, that we skipped over. Um, let's go to the third paragraph, Gabriel, um, because we can uh, maybe get a little bit deeper into that if we go. He goes on a little bit further in the essay Ruskin writes, we will suppose that the master of a household desired to get as much work out of it. This is the, uh, the way the political economists of the time would have viewed it. We will suppose that the master of a household desires only to get as much work out of his servants as he can at the rate of wages he gives. He never allows them to be idle. He feeds them as poorly and lodges them as ill as they will endure. And in all things punish, punish, pushes his requirements to the exact point beyond which he cannot go without forcing the servant to leave him. In doing this, there is no violation on his part of what is commonly called justice. He agrees with the domestic for his whole time and service and takes and takes them. The limits of hardship and treatment being fixed by the practice of other masters in his neighborhood. That is to say, at the current rate of wages for domestic labor. If the servant can get a better place, he is free to take one. And the master can only tell what the real market value of his labor by requiring as much as he will give. And then again, uh, going on a little bit, which is not on your screen. This is the political economical view of the case according to the doctors of that science, who assert by this procedure, the greatest average of work will be obtained from the servant and therefore the greatest benefit to the community and through the community by reversion to the servant himself. This, however, is not so. It would be so if the servant were an engine of which the native the motive power was steam, magnet, magnetism, gravitation, or any other agent of calculable force. But he being on the contrary, an engine whose motive power is a soul, Ruskin's belief in the soul. The force of this very peculiar agent as an unknown quantity enters into all the political economist equations 
without his knowledge and falsifies every one of their results. The lar this is a very important Ruskin line. The largest quantity of work will not be done by this curious engine for pay or under pressure or by any help of any kind of fuel which will be supplied by the cauldron. It will be done only when the motive force, that is to say, the will or spirit of the creature is brought to its greatest strength by its own proper fuel, namely by the affections. So this notion of the affections and that one should care about one's workers, one should care about one's work, one should care about the product that one creates are all essential to what Ruskin's trying to get at here, this notion of a soul. Certainly one of the issues lurking behind um, Darwin, though I don't think he spoke about this directly, is the negation of a soul, the idea that human beings are, 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 are machines like everything else and like water flowing here to there can be measured, etc. No, says Ruskin, this is never the case. Gabriel said earlier, as we began, this idea of consciousness, human beings have consciousness, they can choose to go in this direction or that direction as they see fit, etc. is a central element in what Ruskin's getting at here. Human, we are all quite different from other creatures. We are all quite different from the very powerful forces that shape the natural world. We have a soul, we can choose to move in this direction or not. The mother can eat all the bread crust herself or she can give it to her kids or whatever. She can say that she loves them and then they get all the bread crust and she goes hungry and she starves. She has a choice in the matter. We all have choice in the matter. None of this is automatic. So that, that is a fundamentally different. The, the affections are always there. To leave the affections out and the role of the affections in our Transactions with one another is, a, is, a, is an error colossal, he says later in unto this last, an error colossal as well as strange. All right, so any comments now on this particular discussion to this point, the, this paragraph? I, I'd like to make a comment on a part that you didn't read, Jim, a little earlier. My favorite part of this early piece of unto this last is when um, Ruskin talks about how humans have this, this soul, this humanness that has to be calculated into everything and it's why political science won't work for him. And he gives the metaphor of the science of gymnastics for human beings that have no <laughs> skeletons. And um, he says it's the very same thing. Anytime you calculate a human being without a part that's essential to them and to him, the soul is as essential as the, the skeleton. Then um, if you calculate without that, you're always wrong, right? That's right, because you can calculate it. You cannot calculate it because we never know what people are gonna do. Good, good for you, Kay, I agree. That's a very good passage. Uh, anybody Kay, one else? Of the, one, of the, one of the things uh, that Kay brought up, which I think is, just a, a sideline, we, we often miss, especially in these very earnest um, essays of Ruskin, where he's arguing a point, the humor, you know, and this is that the, the passage that Kay refers to is so classic. Um, um, I should be in those of a science of gymnastics, which assume that men have no skeletons it might be shown on that supposition that it would be advantageous to roll the students up into pellets, flatten them into cakes or stretch them into cables. And that when these results were affected, the reinsertion of the skeleton would be attended with various inconveniences to their constitution. The reasoning might be admirable, the conclusions true and the science deficient only in applicability, but it would be utterly wrong. That's, a, that's his whole point. Yeah, absolutely. But what I love about it is is that is that there's a sly humor here that that uh, he's having fun with this. And most of his readers are not getting the humor, Gabriel. Yeah, <laughs> apparently not. Uh, I should mention here, perhaps, and we can talk about it a little bit later, that when Ruskin's essays began to appear in the Cornhill magazine, it was not long before that the editor of the Cornhill Magazine, who was William McPeace Thackeray, the author of Vanity Fair, uh, began to get letters from outraged readers who said, who is this guy? This guy's an art, art critic. Was, what right has he, what, 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 what competency has he to write on matters of political economy? 
and they uh, they put tremendous as time went on they put tremendous tremendous pressure on the Cornhill magazine to not publish any more essays by this strange fellow on political economy. In the end, it worked. We'll get to that as we move on in, in our next two sessions. Yeah, okay. Gabriel, shall we move on to the fourth paragraph? And I think this is the, uh, the most important. This is in two parts, Jim. Yeah, this is the most um, controversial thing. This is the thing that drove many of Ruskin's readers. Many of the people who would have been, have been have been his readers of unto this last would be, would have been very highly educated people, very wealthy people in the England of his age. Um, and uh, they didn't like what he was saying. He was essentially calling them out and saying that you, you all say that you're good Christians and so on. You take care of the world as your master tells you to take care of the world, but you don't. You really, that you just exploit others and um, for, your own, for your own monetary benefit. So here is the, pass the passage, um, the fourth paragraph for tonight coming from the, the latter part of, uh, of this first essay of, unto this last. The fact is people have never had clearly explained to them the true functions of a merchant with respect to other people. I should like the reader to be very, very clear about this. This is an essential thing and it, it essentially is about the vineyard owner. The five great intellectual professions relating to daily necessities of life have hitherto existed. Three exist necessarily in every civilized nation. The soldier's profession is to defend it, the pastors to teach it, the physicians to keep it in health, the lawyers to enforce justice in it, and the merchants, this is new, no one had ever said this before, to provide for it, to provide for the nation. And the duty of all these men on due occasion is to die for it, on due occasion, namely, the soldier rather than leave his post in battle, the physician rather than leave his post in plague, the pastor rather than teach falsehood, the lawyer rather than in countenance injustice, and the merchant, what is his due occasion of death? It is the main question for the merchant as for all of us, for truly the man who does not know when to die does not know when to live. Okay, and there's more to this, which I'll get to in a moment, but here I wanted to introduce two very, two very important concepts of Plato. Ruskin was an, a deep reader of Plato, an inveterate reader of Plato. He used to read Plato almost as religiously as he did the Bible itself. And the two concepts that I wanted to introduce are the concept of techne and arete. They're all in the Republic, in book one of the Republic. Techne is the work that one does, and Ruskin and Plato argued that there were three aspects to the work that we do in life. We have the ability to do it, the skill to do it, we have the knowledge of how to do it, and we have the wisdom of how to do it best and when to apply it most effectively in order to benefit those who come to us for the excellence that we provide and the work that we do. That is a techne. And if you look at all back at all five of those uh, professions that we talked about a moment ago, all five of them are fundamentally service professions. All techniques come into being in order to serve us in some way. So your mechanic of your car, his, his job or her job as the case may be, is to make your car well and serve it. The, 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 the um, techne of the grocer is to give you good, clean, fresh, healthy food for your table. The techne of a teacher is to teach and bring his students to the highest level of which they are capable and of which he is capable of bringing them and so on down the line. Every profession, every profession exists, does it not friends, um, in order to service in some way. That's why we bring it into being. That's why we keep it around. Uh, so the, so the uh, teacher has a, a function, the pastor has a function, the physician has a function, the soldier has a function and the merchant has a function. And the merchant's function is to provide for the nation the things that it needs in order to, um, in order to be strong and healthy. So here, here's the one of the one of the takeaways of, of this first essay that I think is perfectly clear by now, and is in keeping with the parable of the vineyard owner, and his laborers. The roots of honor are service. When we serve the people for whom we have been brought into being then we are applauded for it, we are thanked for it, we are appreciated for it, we are in many ways, uh, we, we are thought of as uh, admirable people. 
Um, we spontaneously put up statues to people who perform their techniques perfectly. Look around you everywhere, anywhere in the world at statues, awards of all sorts. Uh, we, we honor those who practice their technique as it should be performed. And we ignore or denigrate or in some way punish those who abrogate their technique's responsibilities. Uh, again, look at the statues in, in England. You find statues to Churchill everywhere, to, uh, to Nelson on the top of a column in Trafalgar Square. In Washington, we have statues to Washington. We have a monument to Washington. We have a, one honoring Jefferson, uh, Martin Luther King, veterans of those lost in war. We never have statues to people like Hitler or Attila the Hun because they betray, they betray their techniques. The Academy Awards, the Nobel Prizes, the Congressional Medal of, of Honor are all essentially to honor people for doing the work that we wanted them to do at the best level at which they were capable. The second platonic concept I wanted to introduce here for a moment, uh, and it is essential when Ruskin understands this underneath of what he's saying, is the notion of arete. And the arete is, is essentially the essence of anything. All things that exist have an arete, they have an essence, a raison d'etre, a reason for being. The flower, all the flowers in the world are trying to be perfect flowers. All the, all the, um, and in terms of techniques, the idea of a technique is to practice it to the very best of, of your capability. This is no mystery. We all know this. Uh, it's unambiguous. Uh, and that, but people hated Ruskin for saying this sort of thing that the that the merchant's task was to serve us, was to bring us the things that we truly need in order to live and survive well, and. Um, make us stronger and healthier human beings. They hated him. They hated him for saying all of this, for having the temerity to say that they were um, essentially being inhumane and being hypocrites. So now let me finish with the last bit of this paragraph, um, which is one of the best things that Ruskin, I think, ever wrote. He says, observe the merchant's function or manufacturers for, in the broad sense in which it is used, the word must be understood to include both the merchant's function is to provide for the nation. This, this next bit is one of the things that really got people angry at him. It is no more his function to get profit for himself out of that provision, as it is a clergyman's function to get his stipend. This stipend is a due and necessary adjunct, but not the object of his life, if he be a true clergyman, any more than his fee or honorarium is the object of life to a true physician. Neither is his fee the object of life to a true merchant. All three, if true men, have a work to be done irrespective of fee, to be done even at any cost or, to, or, or to, for quite the contrary of fee. The pastor's function being to teach the physicians to heal and the merchants, as I have said, to provide. That is to say, we're thinking of the merchant now. He has to provide, he has to provide, sorry, that is to say he has to understand to the very root the qualities of the things he deals with and the means of obtaining or producing it. And he has, and he has to apply all his sagacity and energy to, produce, to the producing or obtaining of it in perfect state and distributing at the cheapest possible price where it is most needed. Now, this is what really got people upset with him because they thought they were in it for the money, they thought they were in it for profit. No, says Ruskin, you certainly are entitled to a certain amount of profit from the work that you do. But the, the real reason you are there is to provide a, a good service, a good quality for somebody. When people love their work, uh, they do it automatically. They don't do it for the pay, they do it because they love their work and because they think their work is important and provides a service to somebody. Many of us who are here tonight are, um, are teachers or former teachers. The job of teaching is to make your students as strong as you are capable of making them. To my, my friend Jack always says that the job of the teacher is to give everything he knows or she knows away uh, so that the, uh, the person can benefit from the, from the wisdom that you have. Uh, so this paragraph is one of the great paragraphs in all of Ruskin in my view. I've read it now many, many, many times. And I still think it is one of the great paragraphs in Ruskin. So the idea of business is not to make money. The idea of business is to provide a service that really does some good for other people and to make enough money in the doing of it so that you can go on uh, producing the good that it is that you create for the good of the people that you serve with it. So Gabriel, let's stop there and see if we have any discussion coming from this uh, wonderful paragraph.
We might uh, make a connection here with Gabriel's comment earlier on the common good uh, and then tie that up with the idea of a teacher. When the teacher teaches well, uh, knowledge is made accessible to the student, but the teacher's knowledge isn't somehow reduced. It's actually expanded when the teacher's student <laughs> contributes to the, to the teacher's ability to, to know more. And uh, we have to make a fundamental distinction between uh, uh, imminent goods, goods that really exist within the person and merely fungible external goods. And here again, we have this notion of uh, not only the common good, but what goods are, are transcendent goods. And that too links us uh, earlier on with the, the section that Jim Spates was reading about the, the, the statues. Uh, what a difference, you're, you're reading uh, King James and there's a kind of statue which is what? It's a, a, a graven idol. It's a graven idol and that kind of statue uh, is a graven idol because it distorts the nature of, of reality. Uh, and, and even now, especially with cancel culture, we're looking very closely at the statutes we have. Uh, I, I think probably people in Dresden would not be so keen to have a statue of Churchill uh, there in Dresden. And because we're really interested in what the good is, what's a limited good and what's a good that's uh, a transcending good, we, we were given an opportunity to think very carefully about what's at issue. Yeah, there was this kind of, as I said a moment ago, it's, it was this kind of paragraph that drove Ruskin's readers crazy. Um, and they took great umbrage at, at what he was trying to tell them. He was essentially saying that when it comes to business, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. Um, at, at one point in one of his essays, he calls them, a, they didn't, sit well with them. He calls them a parcel of thieves because essentially what they were, they were, they thought that they were in business for was to make money if they could cut corners here or there or anywhere else. Um, that was, that was good for them because they would then be able to have more jewels or more mansions or more Maseratis or whatever it was that meant a lot to them in terms of their ostentation in the world. None of this is very important. Ruskin always said that the jeweler, jeweler Jewelers administer to uh, jewelers administer to an inelegant pride. Uh, that we don't really need all that stuff. We don't need all of those jewels and things of that uh, uh, that are that are like that. We don't need the Maseratis. We don't need um, those wonderful things, or that we think if we our lives would be much better. As I think Ted said earlier, um, once we get them, if we get something like that, we say, "Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so happy now." And then two weeks later, we want another one. Uh, or want something else that we don't have. So the, the, again, I, I come back to this idea and I want to underscore it as one of the lessons of this, first, uh, of this first essay. The roots of honor are service. When human beings take care of one another to the best of their ability, giving the strength that they have to help other human beings on their way, that is serving them. And that kind of service is, is the essence of doing all, all the techniques that we talked about tonight or any other one you can imagine, any technique that you imagine, its job is to provide some sort of service for somebody. So I wanna come back to that. I wanna come back to the idea of the vineyard owner and the vineyard owner served the people who came to work for him. Some of the people not understanding what, what, he, had, what he was really about said, well, that isn't really quite fair. You paid these people a penny a day. Vineyard owner didn't say this exactly, but certainly thought this. A penny a day is what they need in order to live well in the world. I am responsible for their well-being. Part of the um, essay that I'm skipping over tonight because we don't have enough time to go over it is where he says that when you employ people, you become like a, you become like a parent to them. You become responsible for them, the lives that they lead, the quality of the life that they lead, the well-being of their lives. And to pretend that you are not responsible for them, to underpay them is to weaken them to uh, in some way you know, not give them enough money so that they have enough food to eat or they have enough, um, they, have, they can't clothe themselves in the winter months that are coming on us now. All of that is reprehensible. Hence, if you do that, if you pay, pay people as, as little as possible, 
um, you are you're essentially abrogating your responsibility as a as a responsible person in the world as an employer in the world and it, it is reprehensible and uh, to think that you can do that and that that's just the way it is that it's just business it's just personal it's not business um, is an enormous mistake and reprehensible any other comments on this paragraph and then we go on to our last paragraph um, yeah. Yeah. yeah oh you might go uh, okay thank, thank you so I, I i'd like to pick up a conversation i i had with jim skates over a decade ago now uh, regarding the technique of a day trader um, whose job is literally the opposite of what is stated here it is to to buy cheap and sell high and move value around in that way. Um, someone who's doing that, as you know, we all have investments these days. How does Ruskin respond to a job who's literally to do the opposite of distributing goods at the cheapest possible price where it's needed most? You know? Well, I, uh, th thanks, Trev. Um, Ruskin has a has a direct response to that, not in this essay, but I think in the in the following essay, where he says that you you are still responsible, you as the employer or or you as the worker are still responsible for taking care of the other person whose life you touch, so that fundamentally you must you must do whatever you can to give them the things that they need. That's why a penny a day, a penny a day in Rus in in the time of the biblical parable was enough to take care of that worker for the day and the people depended on him. Um, and so you paid them a penny a day. Maybe you could get by with paying them less, but you would never think to do that because that would be immoral because in Ruskin's view, it is immoral to do anything that weakens another human being. We never do anything consciously or willfully that will, will, will weaken another human being. We only do those things that we know will strengthen them or, or lead them on a path to greater strength. So um, I, I'm not quite sure of, of whom you speak directly, Trevor, but I do, I do know that fundamentally um, Ruskin says that this whole issue of buy, buy in, the, in the least expensive and sell in the dearest markets is, is another one of these fundamental errors that we make in terms of thinking about how to do business. Yeah, Jim? Yes, go ahead, Gabe. Yeah, just to underline something that you said earlier, because I think this is the crucial thing always to see that, that the, uh, the argument here is not an economic argument, first and foremost. It's an argument about the, the nature of human life and the nature of the responsibilities. Right, human well-being. Yeah, and when he, when he says in the paragraph that you cited, this comes just after this paragraph that we have on the uh, screen now. Um, the master, the, the businessman is the master and governor of large masses of men in a more direct though less confessed way than the military officer or the pastor. That's right. So that on him falls in great part the responsibility for the kind of life people lead. Quite so. Because it's re really crucial. And it becomes his duty not only to be always considering how to produce what he sells, in the purest and cheapest forms, but how to make the various employments involved in that production or the transference of it most beneficial to the men employed. So that people who are involved, who are involved in hiring other people there, they must always keep in front of them this idea of what is, what is sufficient to meet the needs and be helpful for the people I hire. That's absolutely right, yes. Shall we go Jim, on? this, this go is ahead. Peter. Yeah, yeah Peter. Um, this brings to mind the, um, the modern notion of servant leadership uh, in which um, rather than the employees uh, there to serve their, their leader, uh, the leader serves their interests um, in terms of, of things that you're talking about. Um, yes. So here, here's, a, here's another way to think about it. One of the, one of the passages we read earlier is that the, 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 the true motivating force is the affections. If, if you have a job, it is your love for the job that drives you on, not the money. I mean, the money is important. You need the money in order to stay alive and, and pay the rent and all those sorts of things. 
but it is the love of the job and the desire to do your technique to the highest level of which you are capable that drives you on. The secretary who stays late at no extra pay to help you with something that you need to get ready for your students the next day or something like that is exactly what he means, that sort of thing. is It's not done for pay, it's done because of the affection for the work or the affection for the people for whom the work is done. And I'll just uh, extend that slightly to, to say, it's also uh, uh, done uh, not with the idea that it brings ultimate fulfillment, but in fact, it does. Yes, I think that's true, Ted. I think that's true. A job well done is a job well done. I often used to say to my students, when you have done the work on the paper that you submit to your professor yourself, you feel much better about it than you do if you found some way to sort of cut corners, cheat a little bit on the side, etc. And it wasn't really your own fully good work. Your own heart feels good. That's the affection part of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gabe, let's yep. move on to the last paragraph. Just, Jim, time. can I make one more comment? Just yeah, out please of, do, of course. Ted's, Ted's comment. Um, there's another much earlier passage in the Roots of Honor that, that talks about that in such a um, uh, clever, cunning way almost. Um, he says, uh, treat the servant kindly with the idea of turning his gratitude to account. Hmm. In other words, to profit. And you will get, as you deserve, no gratitude. <laughs> right. Yes. Nor any value for your kindness. But treat him kindly without any economical purpose. And all economical purposes will be answered. That's right. That's a lovely passage. In, in this, yeah. as in all other matters, uh, quoting the gospel now, Whoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever loses it shall find it. This whole self-sacrificial dimension to, to these roles that people have in society. That's right. That's right. All right. So let's go to our last paragraph, paragraph five, and, um, and then we'll have a little more discussion and then we'll be done for this evening. So Ruskin comes to the end of this essay knowing that he has written some things that many people who will be reading it certainly have not through, thought through with great clarity. And so he, he always believed, that, or he always tried, he always said, I always try never to publish anything unless I know it is true. So he would go and do whatever work, whatever work, whatever he was working on, whether it was architecture or art criticism of Turner or anybody, and worked, worked through it till he thought he had the essence of it and it couldn't be any better than that. That was his affection for the work that he did and his pride, taking his own pride in the work that he did. So here he comes to the end of this first essay with this wonderful paragraph that ends the essay. All of which, meaning everything that we've talked about earlier tonight, sounds very strange. The only real strangeness in the matter being nevertheless, nevertheless that it should so sound. For all of this is true, and that not partially nor theoretically, but everlastingly and practically. All other doctrine than this respecting matter, matters political, being false in premises, absurd in deduction and impossible in practice, consistently with any progressive state of national life. All a life which we now possess as a state, as a nation showing itself in the resolute denial and scorn by a few strong minds and faithful minds, hearts. He has in mind people here like Dickens and Carlyle of the economic principles taught to our multitudes because they were being taught at the time that the object of business is simply to make money. Uh, and, uh, and so far as accepted leads straight to national destruction, respecting the modes and forms of destruction to which they lead. And on the other hand, respecting the farther practical working of true polity, I hope to reason in a following paper, which is leading into his next two papers, which we'll talk about next time. So he knows all of this is controversial. He knows people haven't thought about this very clearly. He has defined in this essay, the real, the real purpose, nobody had ever said this before, clearly, certainly not in English or not to my knowledge, that the real purpose of business is not to make money. The real purpose of business is to serve others, whatever your business or your technique is, to serve others and help them um, get stronger in some way that you are capable of doing. So a poet, Elena was on the line before, I don't know whether she's still with us. So that a poet's job is to write poems that will elevate the understanding of the world of the people who read the poems that she writes. 
And the, the idea of a, a, a technique of, a, of an artist is to paint something or to take a photograph of something or create a sculpture of something that people looking at it will go, oh my goodness, isn't that wonderful? I, I didn't know that before. I didn't think of that before. We are here to serve others. There is Thank no you. other reason that we are here. Human beings have been created to serve other people and to make them stronger. Um, to not do that is both hypocritical, damage, hypocritical, damaging, and in, unconscionable. And that's pretty much the end of the first essay. So any more comments from, from you all before we call it a night? Thank you for that passage, Jim. It's a great passage. And a number of you have pointed up and very nicely, thank you very much for your reading, um, uh, passages that I have left out, uh, selecting out just a few things for us to think about um, in, these, in these talks is, has been exceedingly complex. This is a wonderful book. I hope by the time we're done with these three sessions that you will think about um, Unto This Last is one of the great books of Western civilization, a book that you, if you have not read before, that you, you must read all the way through and very carefully. And if you've read it before, that you must read again all the way through and very carefully. Every time you read it, you will find new, new elements, new aspects to it that you'll say, oh my goodness, what a brilliant way to put that. And I have the, I've been teaching this, this text for 25 years and more, and I still think it is one of the most incredible things I have ever read. Well done, Mr. Ruskin. Well done, you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks You're very welcome. much. Thank, Thank you, you Jim. so much. Thank the vineyard you. owner, folks. Just a, a, a quick uh, housekeeping point. Um, again, I want to thank Jim uh, for guiding us so richly through this, this first essay, the, the Roots of Honor. We look forward to next week's double bill. Um, the two middle essays, uh, The Veins of Wealth and Qui uh, Judicatis Teram. Again, if possible, uh, please go over the study materials for next week. They will be on the website in the calendar section underneath this event, the, where all the links will be. We'll post them there shortly. So, and also I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to say that if anybody has comments or further questions uh, for Jim or suggestions about these and other programs, uh, please email us at info at ruskinartclub.org. Perhaps, anyway. perhaps somebody will develop a parable of universal basic income. Um. <laughs> yes. Well, everyone, a good week and good night. Good week and Thanks good night. And thank together. you again. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. you are welcome. Hey, everybody.